and I'm going to minimize that. All right, so we have looked at ionic substances. We looked at it yesterday, and in order to have an ionic substance, we need two types of atoms. What are the two types of atoms needed for an ionic compound? I need two different atom types for it to be an ionic compound. What are those two types that are needed? Logan, what do you think? Yeah, I need a metal on the left and I need a non-metal on the right. And that's so that the metal atoms can give up their electrons and they'll give them to the non-metal atoms. It will make two oppositely charged ions and those ions, as I desperately look for my two magnets, <laughs> what do the ions do? What do the ions do? Yeah, they stick together. And that's an ionic compound. We want to study ionic compounds today and their properties. So we're going to go through three simple little tests on our ionic compounds in order to see what the properties of ionic compounds are. Because they all have similar properties because of the way they're made up of two ions. So my little note here that I'm going to write is called testing, testing substances. All right, so I'm going to talk about the, the three ways in which we're going to test substances. Number one, the first way is electrical conductivity. Electrical conductivity. What a big long word. What does it mean for a substance to be conductive? Does anybody know what it means for a substance? To be conductive. Yep. It allows, electricity to run it. it allows electricity to run through it. Now I'm going to write out a definition that's a little more uh, that's a little more specific than that, but that's exactly correct. Electrical conductivity is the ability ability, and I apologize that kind of ran into each other of a substance. to allow electric charges, I'm going to put an underline under charges, to flow. Now, flowing electric charges. Remember there are two types of charge, positive and negative. It actually comes from the protons and the electrons. And if some substance allows those charges to flow through it, we have electricity. It's electrical conductivity, all right? Let me give you an example of electrical conductivity. An example of electrical conductivity is a wire. You've probably seen that in maybe shop, if you've taken shop and you've learned about wiring and construction, right? Or you've maybe seen it in grade nine uh, science. I'm going to just draw a simple little wire. And what is it that flows through a wire? Anybody remember or know what flows through a wire to have to be a electrical, to have electricity flow? Yep. It's, it's made of copper, but that's not what's flowing through it. Yep. It's electrons. So I'm going to draw a bunch of circles with some negative in it. Circle, negative, circle, negative, circle, negative. And if I put a positive charge on this end from one end of a battery, and I put a negative charge on that end from another end of the battery, which way are those electrons going to flow? What do you think, Tyson? Which way are they going to move? They're going to move to the left. Those negative electrons are going to be attracted to that negative side. They're going to go the other way because opposites attract, right? So this electricity is going to flow that way. That's an example of electrical conductivity. But we want to know whether a substance can conduct electricity. So a second way in which we can have electrical conductivity is, and I'll just put here a one, here's number two, 
ions in water. All right? Ions in water. Let me draw up what I mean. I'm going to move my, my page down here so I've got a little more room. Okay. If I have a beaker, and this is what we're going to do. We want to test the conductivity. And I have some water in that beaker. And in that beaker, there are some ions. And I'm going to just put some chloride ions. Because chloride ions have a negative charge, right? Remember, they're negative one. They've gained an electron. And if I then put two electrodes in that, wa in that water, I put a wire that's connected to negative and a wire that's connected to positive, what are those negative chlorine ions going to want to do? Any ideas? They're in the water. They can float around and move around. If I put those two charges in there, what will those negative chloride ions want to do if they're able to float around? Max, what do you think? They can float around. They can move around. They're negatively charged. I've put two wires into the water. One of them is negative and one of them is positive. What will that negative chloride want to do? Go to the positive. Just like in the wire, these negative ions will flow to the positive. That's not what you typically think of electricity, but it is a flowing charge. The ions carry the charge instead of an electron carrying the charge. But it's still a flowing charge. This is electrical conductivity. All right? So how do we measure? How to measure. All right? Question mark. We use a conductivity apparatus. We use a conductivity apparatus. I have a conductivity apparatus right here. I've got all kinds of them on the, the lab bench for when we do our lab. So a conductivity apparatus is a very straightforward device. It's two wires connected to a battery, but also in line with it is a little LED. So if I connect these two wires with something that conducts like a piece of metal, and I touch that across there, did you see the LED light up? Can you see it light up? Brett, can you see it? I'm going to go to this side. You've got to look down the barrel of the LED. Can you see it? See that light up? So when you're doing this test, you've got to look right down at that LED to see it light up. Sometimes it doesn't go very bright. So the conductivity apparatus will indicate if it conducts. If I put that on a wire, it will conduct. If I put that in a solution that contains ions, it will conduct. Okay? All right? We're going to do our test of conductivity on the solid. So when we go and do our lab, you're going to grab a little scoop of one of those white powders in the beaker over there. All right? One of them is calcium chloride and the other one is sodium chloride. We're going to test them both the same way. You're going to put a little scoop in one of the little beakers that are sitting there. And you're going to test the conductivity of the solid. You're going to just touch it right into the solid, right into the powder. And you're going to have a look to see if it conducts. In the observations, you're going to say yes or no that it conducted. The observations are easy. Wipe the conductivity apparatus off when you're done with a piece of paper towel. Then you're going to take some water, about, oh, I think it's about 20 milliliters of distilled water, and you're going to dissolve it, swirl it around. Then you're going to put it in the solution that's been created, and you're going to check for the conductivity again. We have to use distilled water. It's very important. Here I've got some distilled water that you're going to use. And here I've got two beakers. And if I take some regular water out of the tap, and I put the conductivity apparatus in that water, and again, I've, you've got to look down the end of it. You see how it's blowing a little bit? 
tap water, what is, what is in here? There's stuff that's in it. Could there be some zinc? Could be. What else? Fluorine for the teeth. Could be some iron, dissolved iron from some pipes. Chlorine from being, uh, being uh, cleaned. You know what I mean? So if we were to do our tests using tap water, we would get an, an incorrect observation because we would see it conduct. If I use a small amount of distilled water, so distilled water has been purified and all of those little impurities have been removed. So I'm going to put a fair bit in because we're going to use this in our lab. And if I put a little bit in here, and I don't want to use too much because that's all the distilled water I have, and I put my conductivity apparatus in it, so I'm going to get really close here to Bella so she can see. Did you see anything? Can you see down there? Nothing? See how it's not lighting up? So we have to use distilled water so that the impurities don't mess with our experiment. All right? Okay. So that's conductivity. The second thing that we are going to measure is, and I'm going to extend the page again. The second thing that we are going to measure is, and what did I write next? Solubility. Number two. Solubility. What an awesome word. What does it mean if it's soluble? What does it mean? Nope. No, that's pliable. That's close. That's not soluble. Solubility. Yep. How well it dissolves. The ability for something to dissolve. The ability to dissolve. We are, we don't need a special apparatus for that. How do we tell if it's soluble? Put some solid in some water, swirl it around for a while, what happens? It disappears. So we don't need to have a fancy measuring device. How do we measure it? Just observe. How to measure just observe, okay? Test number three. Test number three is going to be melting point. We're going to try to measure the temperature at which it melts. The temperature at which a substance melts. I don't think that's earth shattering. The temperature at which a substance melts, okay? How do we measure, or how to measure? How am I going to measure the melting point? Any ideas? How do you measure the temperature? Yep. I can use a thermometer. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to put a little bit of the solid in the deflagrating spoon, and I'm going to hold it over the flame for about 30 seconds, and we're going to see if it melts. And as soon as I see that thing melt, I'm going to take it out, and I'm going to use my infrared thermometer to get a measurement of what that temperature is. So I'll be using this infrared thermometer in order to do that. So how do we measure it? A thermometer. Okay. That's the end of my note on what we're going to be measuring. So I'm going to just stop my video at this point.